Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're delighted you could do so. Uh, I am Professor Richard Preziosi, and I'm here to welcome you to the next in our series of our inaugural professorial lectures. Um, this evening, I'm very honored to be able to introduce uh, Professor Mike Cunliffe, uh, who I'm also very happy is a member of staff uh, in my school, which is the School of Biological and Marine Sciences. Uh, so without going on more, to provide the formal introduction, I will hand over to Professor John Spicer. Don't know about a formal introduction, <laughs> but I'll try my hardest. Marine biology is fascinating, isn't it? I mean, you think you've got it, you think you understand how the sea works, and then something else comes along and you think, wow, that's, who would have thought? Who would have thought back in 1880, sort of, when they did the whole world, Challenger, and that was it. We knew how the ocean worked, sort of. And then through the 20th century, things kept on happening. And I remember vividly learning about plankton. It was great because the only thing that made things work were phytoplankton and zooplankton. And that was easy. And the fish ate them and life is happy. And Alistair Hardy's book became the main thing that you read. It was great. And then these people kept on banging on about the tiny things, the stuff that no one gives a uh, marine snow about. Tiny things. And all of a sudden, we started to realise that our ocean was not the ocean that we thought, but in fact was a microbial ocean. And that change in marine biology, which has been happening, and it is a major change to our understanding of how the sea works, has been championed by people who kept on saying small things are important. Small things are really, really interesting. And as a result of that, microbial biology in the, the ocean, I put to you, is a bit like the Victorian age, where the folk who are involved in it get to do really cool things, like look and see things for the first time and do basic experiments in a way that you can't do anymore. We have here Michael, Michael Cunliffe. He's one of those 21st century, 19th century naturalists. <laughs> I put to you. <laughs> That's even though he did start off doing environmental biology in Liverpool, did a master's in pollution, and then ended up in Manchester. Who would end up in Manchester? It's difficult to know, isn't it? Doing microbiology, not even proper marine microbiology. Or, or was there any marine in it at all? No, so that, but that's fine. Um, it <laughs> joined the MBA in, in 2010 as an MBA research fellow, and then in 2014 he saw the light and decided that it would be good to have a joint appointment with the University of Plymouth, as well as the MBA. Currently, he's Director of Science, and he is now Professor of Marine Microbiology, doing the sorts of things that naturalists and scientists were doing 100, 200 years ago for creatures that most of us have no idea about. And it did say in the, the trail, not the trailer to this, the, 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 they gave a spoiler alert on the, on the web that said there are no marine mushrooms. That might be sort of true, but I can tell you this man has made mushroom for fungi in the marine world. Uh, <laughs> it's too good to miss. No, no, no. Do you know the best part? All of what I've told you, as far as I'm concerned, is true, but it's not the important part. Believe it or not. The important part is Michael is a sterling human being. He's, a, he's collegiate and he's a good friend. And I know that many of you here will know that as well. And to have someone who is genuinely uncovering things that we could barely imagine. I mean, usually they're in the stratosphere somewhere and many of us can call him friend. And he is a good friend. I look forward to the expert and the friend telling all of us about these amazing little fungi. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, I, just before we start, there's nothing quite as sinister as looking at a large photograph of yourself. <laughs> it's probably the most horrid thing I've seen quite, quite recently. So I'm glad that's gone. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, thank you, thank you, Richard. Um, yeah, and welcome, everybody. 
yeah, I can't beat John's um, dad jokes, unfortunately. There won't be any of those. Um, and it's going to try and take you through um, some of the stuff that we've been doing um, recently and then try and see if I can show you how we got there. Yeah, and so, um, <clears throat> as John said, I, I, so I, just to say, I've been to a few of these um, professorial lectures like now, and they often start with the obligatory photograph of child squatting in rock pool. So I, I don't have one of those, unfortunately. I, I asked my parents, they, they don't exist, so that, that is not gonna happen. <laughs> Um, we'll just get straight into the into the good stuff. And so, as John mentioned, where did it all start for me? So, ignoring undergraduate and, and masters, it started with a PhD. And my PhD was not in in anything aquatic at all. It was in soil microbiology. So I started at Manchester, looking at the microbial ecology of polluted soils. Um, and so we were particularly interested in at the time. So in the early noughties, the mid noughties. Um, people had this idea that maybe you could, if you had a polluted soil, you could take bacteria that can degrade pollutants, you could put that in the polluted soil and maybe that it would clean it up for you. So that was this, something that we call bio-augmentation, which is part of bioremediation as a philosophy. So lots of people were out there coming up with these great ideas, getting people to fund it, that you could have some this microbe that would clean up um, soil pollution. And so I spent my PhD basically proving that it was a lot of rubbish. So basically these bacteria, they do amazing things in the laboratory, but as soon as you put them in the, in, the, in the real world, in the soil, they just do something else completely differently. And so that was a bit, a bit of, a, of, a, of a downer. And it's quite interesting uh, when I talk to PhD students now to have a PhD based on things just being like, no result, nothing happened. But it, it works and you can, can make a career out of it. I'm just quite, this is just a, a few different things that I did. I'm just out, out of interest, does anybody, anybody under the age of 30 know what, what this image is? You have to, anybody? No. This was, this was the hottest technique at the time. This is called denaturing gradient gel electrophoresis. Uh, yeah, and it's quite, I don't think about the past stuff so much now. Um, and I'm not that old really. Um, but when I look at this, I realize how, how far things have moved and progressed. So it was the, the the early noughties, the mid noughties, and at, at the time, um, working with nucleic acids in soils was still quite tricky. I mean, I don't know how, um, now if, if I go in the cell molecular lab at the MBA, I just see kits everywhere. So this is, this is the, the period when kits were starting to only really come in. They were very expensive, and much of what we had to do in the lab, um, we had to do by hand, long, long hand molecular biology. And I'd finished working with soil thinking, I just can't do this anymore. And so I thought I had this bright idea, moving from soil to aquatic, particularly marine, just might make things much easier. And it, and it actually did. So I, I started a postdoc then at the University of Warwick, uh, working on, on marine microbes. And this is when the marine, the marine transition happened. So I worked on uh, a part of the ocean called the sea surface microlayer. This is the earth sea interface. So this is where the atmosphere and the ocean um, comes together. Um, I was very lucky. I mean, I should say this about my PhD, but even more so about my postdoc. I had a postdoc supervisor who was very much, as long as I worked within the theme of the topic that was proposed, I could do effectively whatever I wanted within the theme of the topic. And that's something I've tried to sort of maintain. And so we did lots of different things, looked at, you know, microbial ecology of the sea surface microlayer. One of the really, I guess, major achievements of the postdoc was running a large scale mesocosm experiment. So um, there was a period where many people, there would be this sort of pilgrimage to the University of Bergen Marine Station to run a mesocosm experiment. And this is one of these mesocosm experiments that we ran. So these are multiple three and a half thousand litre seawater mesocosms where we'd induce phytoplankton blooms and look at the impact that that would have uh, on the sea surface microlayer. And I used to get very precious about this, so I, I still get quite precious about some things. And I set up this, this mesocosm experiment in Bergen, um, set it up and, and ran it. And I was very, very particular about people going near the mesocosm or doing anything with the mesocosm without gloved hands. And I really like this photograph because it, this individual is sampling my, my mesocosm <laughs> Um, with no gloved hands. And I, some of you may know who this is. This is Angela Hatton, who was um, quite a, a prominent um, sort of microbial biotechnology person. She became 
head of science, I think, at NOC, and now is something big at the University of Aberystwyth. So, yeah, Angela's messing with my mesocosm with naked hands. Um, we did lots of things. Again, being in, an, being in a lab, in Colin Murrell's lab at the University of Warwick, where there was um, this freedom to explore and do things that I, that I wanted, and we did a range of different things. But one of the key things, just to put in your mind, is we spent a lot of time describing the earth -Sea interface, the sea surface microlayer, and really characterizing what that habitat is in a, at a microbial scale. And so we, I guess, we really came up with this idea that the earth -Sea interface is actually a gelatinous biofilm. And the thing that makes the earth -Sea interface gelatinous is something called transparent exopolymer particles, so TEP. Uh, I'm gonna come back to these TEP um, when I start to talk about my time uh, here in Plymouth. So moving from, from the postdoc at the University of Warwick, I then came down to Plymouth. Um, and when I came down to Plymouth, I, I, again, it was, I mean, my former boss is sat here now, which is Colin, Colin Brownlee when I first came down to Plymouth. Uh, and I, 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 it was again, just, you know, free reign. Well, just do whatever it is that you want to do. Um, and it was quite interesting. I, when I first came here, I, I, I met lots of different people and did lots of different things. Um, I remember, I, I feel like I got sent to see Richard Thompson, which was a sort of weird experience in itself. Richard was just a, <laughs> Richard, Richard was just a normal person back then. Um, this is in 2010, just a normal, do you remember that time, Joe, when he, when he was just a normal person? Richard was just a normal person and you get, go to see him. And I can always remember this um, Tupperware box that he had and inside the Tupperware box was a decomposed carrier bag. I don't know if he still, he still has that Tupperware box. So I, you know, inspired by Richard, we did some work on plastics. I can see Jason somewhere, Jason and Colin, uh, not that Colin, the other Colin, Colin Munn, did some work with them on hydrotherm on these um, CO2 vent seeps, and we did some biofilm work. So lots of interesting, very engaging and beautiful things. But what I want to try and do for this lecture is just focus on one thread that I've followed throughout my time here in Plymouth that's really led to where, where, we, where we are now. So to do that, I just want you to have in your minds transparent exopolymer particles. So these are TEP. So these are polysaccharide-based gels. Um, they're really abundant in the marine environment. They can be a really major component to POC, particulate organic carbon. Um, they're made mainly by diatoms, but other phytoplankton make them as well. And they have lots of important ecosystem functions. They make the sea surface microlayer, the gelatinous biofilm, but they also make marine snow particles form. They make ice nucleating particles in the atmosphere. They do lots of different things. So one of the first things we did um, when we came here, or when I came, we, it was sort of strange, um, when I came to, the, um, to Plymouth was try and figure out who were the bacteria involved in processing TEP? So I was still in this very bacteria-focused um, way of thinking. So we went at this in a range of different strategies, uh, tried a range of different approaches. The classic ecological approach was to go out into seawater, collect seawater samples, look at bacterial diversity, measure TEP, correlate the two, which, you know, which bacterial groups go up when TEP goes down and vice versa. And so we identified some groups like the Flavobacteriales and the Rhodobacteriales, so maybe these are potential TEP um, degraders. I also still, st um, I still do it now, but I used to have quite strange ideas, and, uh, and usually I'm quite lucky that people work in my group who indulge these strange ideas. So I managed to convince um, Berta, Berta Zanke, who was a postdoc, but she was a PhD student at the time, then she became a postdoc, that maybe she should pick individual TEP particles. So if she could pick individual TEP particles and we could sequence them, we could see the bacteria that was attached onto them. And Berta, were, well, is, was exceptionally polite and she would almost just like engage in whatever it was I would said. So she spent a week in the lab at the microscope trying to pick individual TEP particles. So these particles are about 50 microns across, very tiny, very sticky give somebody a nervous breakdown, that kind of thing. But Berta did it and we sequenced them and we found some bacteria that are attached to these TEP particles. So we've got these candidates for bacteria that process TEP, Rhodobacteriales, um, Flavobacteriales and Alteromonadiales. These are a pretty well-known bacterial orders. Okay, so we're, we're getting to who the bacteria might be that are degrading TEP. 
But the real, the real way to sort of prove how that carbon flows from TEP into bacteria is to do something called a stabilized tote probing experiment. So stabilized tote probing is a technique where you take um, isotopically enriched substrates. So in the case of carbon, natural carbon exists in the environment with an isotopic ratio of 12. But there are heavier isotopes of carbon which have a molecular mass of 13. And so if you can somehow label a substrate with isotopically labeled um, enriched 13 C carbon, and organisms consume that 13C label carbon, you, you would then identify the organisms that have consumed the substrate. It's a classic ice, um, stable isotope probing experiment. So 13C labeled TEP, believe it or not, is not available in the shops. Um, you can buy some 13C labeled substrates. And so what we had to do was take some 13C labeled bicarbonate. We made our diatoms grow. The diatoms become 13C labeled. They make 13C labeled TEP. And then we put our 30 c label TEP into some seawater and we, we track where the carbon goes. We sequence the DNA of these higher and um, heavier organisms because they've consumed the 13C. And we got what we were looking for, basically. So we showed 13C enrichment in these orders that we predicted that would be TEP degraders. So Rhodobacteriales, Flavobacteriales, Alteromonadiales. And so... When we got this result, it was great. And if this is, this is what we should all be doing, isn't it? You know, developing hypotheses, testing hypotheses. Um, I think this is supposed to be Plato. But we spent a really long time developing this technique. And Joe Taylor, who was the postdoc in the lab, who really made all of this happen, I can distinctly remember him coming to see me. And we, we spent two years getting this result that sort of told us what we knew already, just confirmation, which is absolutely fine. So Joe said, well, why don't we just try? Just we've got, we've got boxes and boxes of PCR primers in the freezer. Why don't we just try and just sequence stuff and just see what we get? You know, to so I don't know, Karl Popper and all those people would be really angry with us. We had no hypotheses. So John said, don't wave your hands. <laughs> so um, probably no hypotheses, we've just got all this DNA that's 13C enriched, let's just try some different things. And so we, we tried with the eukaryotes and then we got this, this result. So this is, we genuinely weren't looking for or, um, fungi in any sort of way and what we showed in, with the 13C enrichment is this really high spike in fungi. So no hypothesis, we just found this. And genuinely, People talk about, well, I don't know, maybe some people do, some people don't, career changing moments. And this had a really big impact on me. This really completely changed the direction in where I was going. And this is this had was again no hypothesis, sort of on a Friday afternoon thinking, what extra can we do with the data that we've got? And what we found is if we look at the eukaryotes in the data set, we saw this really high spike in fungi, which really indicates that maybe marine fungi are also involved in processing TEP. So I can remember when Joe Taylor came to see me and he said, oh, marine fungi are consuming TEP. And I, <laughs> I should, please don't tell anybody this is a bit of a secret now. I genuinely thought marine fungi, do they even exist? I, even, I didn't even, I genuinely, they, I, they'd never entered my consciousness before. And it's quite funny, often when I speak to people about marine fungi, many people say to me, do marine, they didn't even know that marine fungi actually exist. And, you know, 10 years later, I'm now giving this professorial talk about marine fungi, so that, that says a lot. So seriously, uh, I think marine fungi. So the next thing I did was this, and, that, and, 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 and this, is not, this is not a bit of fun to make it whimsical in the professor. This is genuinely true. I sat in my office going, well, what, what do we actually know about marine fungi? And very little as it, as it happens. So even, even, I'm not so sure we know that much more about them now, but even a decade ago, there was a few studies on the diversity of, on, of marine fungi, but not that much. And certainly nothing systematic, nothing mechanistic. We didn't, you know, a few studies on, on patches of what diversity might look like, but, but nothing, nothing important. So then I'm left thinking, right, so how do I, where do I start? How do I progress um, in trying to understand marine fungi. And I think this is where location and where you are institutionally, so obviously being at the NBA and being in Plymouth more, more widely had a really big effect on me. 
And so there is a long history of looking at plankton diversity at the MBA, and it goes right, right back to the very, very start, okay? I, I, I tried to, so this is, a, I guess, a non-scientific way of thinking about it, and I, I'm not, I tried to think of how to articulate this clearly, and I've, I can't get it quite right, so I'm just going to say what I think and then, you know, interpret it as you will. I, I genuinely think where we work as scientists, it matters who is around us now and who was in where we were in the past. And I think there's just some sort of osmosis about the science that people did or do in our institutes now and did in our institutes in the past that impact us, and they certainly impact me. I, I was thinking about, I don't know if it's an urban legend, this American boy in the bubble, this boy that was like trapped in a, in a bubble as an experiment and he was isolated from the outside world. And I think as a scientist, could you really function if you were isolated from other scientists now and other scientists in the past? And one of the great, amazing and beautiful things about working at the MBA and working in Plymouth is we have this ultra legacy of people that if you just open your eyes and open your ears and, and read, are just screaming back at us about all the amazing things that they did. So who have we got here? I don't think you did mention Garstang, did you, John? So we go back, we've got people like, let's have a little, you're getting a free drink after this anyway, but audience participation. Um, who's this at the, at the beginning? Please stop screaming so loudly. It's, uh, anybody? It is Colin, Walter Garstang, yes. Um, the lady at the, at the far side? Marie Le Ball. Mary Park. Yeah, but well, you're, you're ahead of us already, Colin. Frederick Russell, well done. I, I did sort of hope that maybe the non-MBA people would have got it, but that's all right. So we've got Garstang, Le Ball, Park, Southwood, Russell. And basically, all of these people, in all of their own rights, have all done like, ultra amazing stuff. And what you do when you work at the MBA is you just basically stand on their shoulders and like, go a little bit, a bit further. Basically, I just want to mention a couple of of what they did. So John mentioned this sort of Victoriana sort of naturalist approach to marine biology, and I think Garstang typifies this so well. So I also, what amazes me about Garstang and others, it's it's not unique to the time, is. Um, if you actually look at what they did <laughs> compared to what we have to do now as scientists, it's completely different. So Garstang basically racked up at the MBA, um, really when it very first opened. He's one of the first working scientists at the MBA. And he did this whole sort of, when he very first started, um, I don't know if people are familiar with the, the TV show Catchphrase and this idea is just say what you see. And that's basically what Garstang did. He would go out on a boat, he would collect a plankton sample, and he would just describe it and just say what you could see. So he would come up with descriptors that look like this, you know. Um, this is his description of the plankton in March and what, what would happen. And what's quite cool is, in fact, this, these observations that Garstang made basically still occur now, you know, all, all this time ahead. And then we had really, I mean, true pioneers like Mary Labor. Mary Labor, you think when she's active in the early 1900s as a female scientist, it, I mean, the whole it's a man's world it, is an understatement for some of these people. And Marie Labor was a real plankton pioneer. She really brought in quantitative approaches, taken away from, from Garstang's approaches. So these people really inspired me to think, right, if we want to understand the diversity of marine fungi, the way that we need to go about it is with a sort of time series, a consistent approach. Because that's what these people did. They just went out and they observed. They went out regularly in the waters of Plymouth and just described what it is that they can see. Um, and so that's what we did. We, wanna, we wanted to try and improve our understanding of marine fungal diversity, and we wanted to do that really just by describing it. And I, I mean, John mentioned this at the start. I think it's, it's so important when we, when we think about the natural world, it's so complicated that sometimes that first approach is just observational. It's about describing what we can see. And we spent a lot of time doing different studies but I'm just going to focus on our more recent study because I think this really typifies exactly what I'm trying to get to. So what did we do? We really asked some fundamental questions. You know, what are the diversity patterns of marine fungi and how do those diversity patterns change over time? And it really was a known. I mean, you know, the fact that 
where are we now? We're a quarter of the way into the 21st century. This is still an open question that we need to, to think about more. So we performed a 17-year study um, in the waters off Plymouth. So I mentioned Station L4 quite a few times. Station L4 is a time series site. It's off Plymouth. Um, it's been studied for a really long time by people people at the MBA and others, others in Plymouth. And we asked some really fundamental questions, just basics. I mean, does diversity change within years and between years? I mean, how obvious is that? You know, what are the environmental parameters that's driving this change? Just a couple of, of examples. I'm just mindful of the time I'm talking um, way, way too much. So this is L4 station here off Plymouth. Uh, we had samples collected over 17 years. I'm not going to bother um, with the details, but basically what we do is we take seawater, we filter it, we extract the DNA, and then we sequence it. And that gives us an understanding of what, what fungal diversity actually looks like. And what we actually showed was was just this really we saw seasonal cycles in marine fungal diversity and this just hadn't been shown before and if you think about seasonality within other systems it's just completely taken as red you know daffodils in spring swallows in summer leaves falling in autumn these are all just um, seasonal things within ecosystems that we know quite well and we didn't know that at all in fungal ecosystems before we did that this is a pretty pretty busy um image is it's a figure taken from the paper but basically we showed this seasonality across different scales so winter and spring are different to each other but also differences um three months so when we look at the data we can look at the community level but we can also look at different individual taxa so this is one of my absolute pet favorite fungi this is the genus mechnicobia mechnicobia show this really beautiful patterning within the time series so if we look this is our, um, a way that we can describe the distribution of Mechnicobia within the time series. And we can see that Mechnicobia has this really nice reoccurrence pattern on every 52 weeks. So that means every 52 weeks, i.e. once a year, this organism reappears. And then if we look in an average year over the time series, we can see when Mechnicobia appears in the time series. Mechnicobia... Um, is a is a parasite. It's a parasite of copepods. It was discovered in the in the late 60s, early 70s, and so the fact that we see this fungus peaking during the, the spring bloom and copepods bloom really indicates to us that this is probably infecting copepods at that time. We don't know anything about the impact this might be having on the system. We don't know anything it might be having impact on the copepods. It's completely understudied. So. Within the time series, looking at fungal diversity, we see, um, uh, I guess, marine fungi, and we can describe those patterns. Um, but one of the things that we also saw was in the lower abundance um, samples, many fungi that shouldn't be there. So what we would, fungi that we perhaps would expect to see within terrestrial systems. So some of the fungi that we would see are fungi that are typically found in leaf litter or on bark in trees. And we were trying to, trying to make sense of that. And in fact, what's quite interesting is we only see these fungi, particularly in the winter and in the autumn. So why is that? Why is it that we're seeing these, these if you like, mushroom type fungi at L4 station? So, I mean, I just want to really make a point. I've talked about this before to other people and people often get the wrong impression of what it is and they're about to say. I just want to be super clear. There are no um, marine mushrooms. I'm not pretending that there's marine mushrooms. This is actually, um, I mean, this is a bit of an obsession of mine at the moment, is this asking AI to tell me what research I do. So this is, this is a <laughs> AI picture. Did, did anybody think, please? Nobody thought this was really brilliant, all right. So this is a bit of an obsession of mine at the moment. I don't know. If anybody's been following this story of, of scientists getting AI to describe their research. So this is basically what AI thinks I do. There are no marine mushrooms, they don't exist. And, and, and Richard made it quite clear that a structure like this probably wouldn't last five minutes in the marine environment anyway. So if you don't take anything away from this lecture other than there are no marine mushrooms, okay? Or in fact, where's this signal coming from? Okay. So we're trying to make sense of this signal uh, that we're seeing of, of these potentially terrestrial derived fungi. This is something we're working on right now. So you are here. This is L4 station that, we've, that we, um, we've, we've talked about already. 
And what we've spent some time doing is actually looking at other locations that are connected to L4 station and looking at fungal diversity within these places to see if they can help us make sense of what we see here at L4. And it's the same again, collect seawater, filter seawater, but this time we're using DNA and RNA to understand um, fungal diversity. I'm more than happy to talk about techniques and methods later that people need to know. So we get a figure that looks like this, that's, that's, that's pretty busy. So we've got um, types of fungi across the top, classes and orders, and then we've got these different locations. So we've got a site in the Tavy moorland, a woodland site, and then West Mud, which is just here. And the breakwater is here, just sort of in the sound, and, and then L4. And then we pool these open ocean sites. And there's lots going on here, but just to sort of cut to the chase, really, um, these potential marine mushrooms that we're seeing, we're getting a stronger signature from them in the woodland and the moorland. And so they're probably coming from these terrestrial locations, and then they're coming from these terrestrial locations and basically getting washed out to sea, all right? Which is sort of makes sense. Is that a massive, is that a massive discovery? I'm, I'm not so sure. And so this is the, the view from my office at the MBA. So I took this yesterday evening, and you can look out to, to L4 station. So what we're trying to think about now is what actually what's the transport mechanism? How are these fungi that are living their best life in a wood in, on the TV making it out to L4 station? What's the mechanism that they're doing to do that? Um, at the moment, or yesterday and certainly today, the, the sound looks nice and blue. But when we've had heavy rainfall, the sound often changes colour, and it often changes colour because it goes brown. And the reason it goes brown is because there's lots of particulate material that's being washed down, um, down the river. So, again, crazy experiment time, and this time the gullible individuals, Cordelia, I've seen Cordelia somewhere, she's here. So I said to Cordelia, right, maybe we've got a, hyp we've got a hypothesis, so Plato, Plato would be happy. Um, maybe it's this particulate material that's transferring fungi from the terrestrial to the marine. And so Cordelia um, went to Plymouth Sound, well to L4 station, and she collected all these individual particles, again, picking them down the microscope. And we actually see lots of heterogeneity in different types of particles, okay? So we get particles that we associate with zooplankton, particles that we associate with detritus, and then these different types of aggregates. Cordelia picked them and extracted their RNA, and she described them quite well. And so what we basically have now is a sense of what the particle scape might be in the waters of Plymouth. And particles come in different shapes and sizes. They're in different types of categories. Um, I guess just to, there's lots of detail here, but again, a bit of audience participation. Would anybody like to guess what one of the major groups of fungi are attached and growing on these particles, particularly particles that we see that are probably washed down from terrestrial systems? It's basically our mushrooms. And so what we think we have now is, a, is, a, is we, we observe these fungi living in the coastal systems. We think they're coming from terrestrial um, locations, and then they're probably coming from terrestrial locations because they're attached to particles. And so that's just an example of this, this, this mechanistic approach that we try and have to try and join all of this together. Okay, where are we going um, next? So. Now for something slightly different with your, with your brains. So I want to talk to you about evolution. And obviously, we're going to talk about the evolution of marine fungi. But what I want to try and do is get a few concepts in your mind before we start to sort of push into it a little bit. So before we think about the evolution of marine fungi, let's just think about the evolution of the marine tetrapods, if you don't regularly think about the evolution of the marine tetrapods. So we've got a few, a few concepts to think about. Um, tetrapods evolved, or marine tetrapods evolved from terrestrial ancestors, okay? And they only did it a very few number of times. So there's a, a small handful of marine tetrapods, not so many, um, pinniped cetaceans, you know, testudines, a few, a few um, mar marine reptiles. And then what happened is they, they transitioned into the marine and then they radiated into the species that we see today, okay? So a few transitional events and then species radiation, maybe that's concept one to have in your heads. 
And then we also have within the marine fungi, I'm sorry, within um, tetrapods, this idea of convergent evolution. So in many cases, part of their adaptive change to being in the marine environment is the, the flippers. So penguins have flippers and turtles have flippers and whales have flippers. That's a, that's a convergent um, thing that happened between them. So try and keep those two in your mind. Now then, what do we know about the evolution of marine fungi? <laughs> Anybody? Yeah, I, again, you can see where this is going. Not, not much at all. And so we'd, we've been trying to sort of think about this at the moment. This is from somebody else's study. This is not our, our work. This is from Fabian Berkey's group uh, in Sweden. And Fabian Berkey has been looking at terrestrial to marine transition across all of the eukaryotes. So the whole of the eukaryote tree of life. And what Fabian showed is the, the weird things that really stand out are the fungi. So if you look in Fabian's figure here, the fungi are down here. And what's really strange about marine fungi is that they've, they've transitioned from marine to terrest terrestrial multiple times. They really stand out compared to everything else. If you think tetrapods have only done it seven, nine times, marine fungi have done it lots of different times. So really quite fundamentally different. So for me, that's actually quite interesting how a group of organisms have done it in multiple different ways. And then if we think about flippers on tetrapods as convergent adaptive strategies, do we, are there, this is a genuine question, are there convergent adaptive strategies within all this radiation of different types of marine fungi? So when I look at um, data that looks like this, where we've seen these groups like these um, Ag Agariomycetes that are transitioning from you know, freshwater to marine, is this actually, uh, we can look at this in terms of trying to dis describe the diversity of, of what it is right now, but maybe this is also a mechanism through which terrestrial to marine transition is actually uh, happening. So I want to go back to Mechnicobia. Mechnicobia is this um, fungus, that I'm, uh, this yeast that I'm particularly obsessed about. It's the, it's the one that can, is probably killing um, um, copepods Mechnicovia is a really big genus of yeasts, okay? So we have marine, aquatic Mechnicovia. These are in blue. So this is our Mechnicovia zobelli that we, we, we isolated from, from, um, from, from local waters around Plymouth. This sits in a group of other species that are all aquatic. So we've got a few marines and these are fresh water. But all these other relatives of Mechnicobia that are aquatic are not aquatic. They're actually terrestrially derived, plant derived. And so part of what I'm quite interested in at the moment is trying to understand, is this a good model system to understand how marine fungi evolve? Because we've got a clade of aquatic, some of them marine, versus a load that are plant associated. And think about what we're seeing at L4 station, the fact that some marine fungi that are plant associated get washed into the sea, or get washed into the river and float out to sea. So what we've been doing is taking culture representatives across this sort of diversity. So other marines, fresh water, and these different plant associated Mechnicovia who've never experienced um, marine or aquatic and just seen how they can deal with it. And one of the things that's probably a major challenge for these organisms is what, what um, people refer to as the salt barrier. So if you're going to evolve from being terrestrial to freshwater to marine, the major stress that you're probably going to have to undertake is dealing with salt and salinity. And what we actually find is if we look at Mechnicovia from petals or from um, flower nectaries, or from fruit or all these different ecosystems, there's no obvious pattern in how they're responding to salinity change. So this is a, a salinity gradient here across the bottom. And so this is, a, this, is a, this is really in my mind at the moment, trying to understand how marine fungi evolved. Um, and this is work that uh, Kim Bird and I are working on right now. So I'm, I'm mindful of running out of time. Um, there are no marine mushrooms. Uh, but there are some macroscopic marine fungi, and these are the marine lichens. I'm just going to spend the last 10 minutes really talking about some of our work on, on marine lichens. If you don't know much about lichens already, lichens are a symbiosis. They're a symbiosis between fungi and algae that live inside them. Those algae can be eukaryotic or they can be cyanobacterial. 
Um, they live across a range of different habitats, including marine and, and maritime. We've been doing quite a lot of work with this fungus, Lycaena pygmaea. Lycaena pygmaea is a marine cyanolichen. Um, you might have seen it. Um, it's really common around the, the, the coast of the southwest. If you look through cross-section, this is where it looks like. These are the algae um, that live inside. There's actually a long history of Lycaena pygmaea, pygmaea research conducted at the MBA. Um, first paper by, by Gladys Naylor and John Coleman and, and Boney, but um, again, Gladys Naylor publishing in the 1930s as a single female author, I think is actually you know, you know, quite, quite impressive. And Gladys made this really impressive survey of Lycaena pygmaea and then the sister species Confinus in these, all these different locations uh, around the Southwest. And again, this is just me pointing out things that I find cool and interesting. We have an her herbarium at the MBA um, that's been going for quite some time. And I was rooting around in the herbarium uh, relatively recently and we actually found some of Gladys Naylor's original samples. So you can see GLN, which is Gladys Naylor. These were collected in June, 1929. And if you actually, you think these lichens in this matchbox that Gladys collected are nearly a hundred years old, and they look unbelievably like lichens look now growing on the rocky shore, which says a lot about, about lichens. So I, I've just had a, a bit of an obsession with, with lichens recently. So we, we were looking at the, at the cyanobacteria that's in Lycaena pygmaea. And we made the discovery that in fact, um, before, before we'd worked on it, people thought there was only one cyanobacteria in Lycaena pygmaea, a <coughs> genus called uh, Rivularia. Um, we went to some of the, we re revisited some of the night, some of the sites that um, Gladys Naylor went to in 1929. So we went to Wembury and Rheim. And to cut a long story short, basically we discovered that um, uh, Lycaena has two symbionts, not one. So it has um, Rivularia and it has a second one, which is Pleurocapsa. So why might I, I hear you ask, why would they have two symbionts? So Alistair, can we play the video? So this is like kind of Pygmaea living on the shore um, below the MBA. And if you don't regularly think about what life's like for a marine organism living in the other tidal zone, but I know, I know some people do, um, but not everybody does. It's actually quite a stressful habitat. You go from being very dry um, to being very wet. And sometimes when you're very wet, you might be exposed to rainwater or sometimes you might be exposed to seawater. So we was thinking maybe the reason that Lycaena pygmaea has two symbionts is actually to deal with this variation in living in this environment. So I, we collected some Lycaena pygmaea samples. So this is um, Nathan Christmas, who was a postdoc, he's left now. And this is Beth, who was a master's student. Be Beth, tell the audience as well. Um, and I, I, I can't tell you how much I love this photograph, because for me, this just typifies the amazingness of being in Plymouth. This is basically what I call urban marine biology because this is the intertidal zone below the MBA, and we've got graffiti, and we've got, em well, hopefully it's an empty can of lager, and you, you can't smell from photographs, but if you could, there'd be such a strong, strong smell of marijuana. It's actually quite, quite powerful. So if you ever, you know, you want to go and sit and collect samples, this is the place to do it. And, and what's really cool is we can collect lichens, we can chuck them in our cylinder of liquid nitrogen, get them back to the lab and do some experiments. So what do we, we do? We're using our molecular tools. This is the, so the sort of, catalog photograph of Beth um, grinding uh, <laughs> like kind of pygmaea. Sorry, I'm teasing this stuff there. So what do we do? We were particularly interested in the genes that are being transcribed. So what genes Lycaena and its symbionts are activating? Okay, so to do that, we use um, transcriptomics. And this is what the data look like. And it's a bit complicated and it's and I can I can sense Maya as our sort of comms person saying, don't present complicated data, but I just want to show you what the type of data is that we look at. But basically, if you look at this top figure here, you can see what might be happening within the symbiosis. Blue is rivularia, green is pleurocapsa, and basically one symbiont is more active at high tide and one symbiont is more active at low tide. And so what we think is happening within this symbiosis is a switching between the two different symbionts. I think we've made this cartoon to try and sort of summarize what we think is happening. And we think both symbionts, both cyanobacteria, when they're um, impacted by seawater, they become stressed. They, when they're stressed, they produce extracellular polysaccharide. 
they make this extracellular polysaccharide and that's actually what the fungus, the lichen, is consuming through these various different mechanisms. So this is recent work and when we did this we got very, very excited because we thought, oh my god, we've made this major, major discovery. Because this is totally counterintuitive to the current paradigm of lichen symbiosis, okay? So this is um, from two review articles of two leading groups in lichen symbiosis, one in Canada, one in Austria. And the fundamental paradigm that they work to is that cyanobacteria exchange glucose with the fungal host, not extracellular polysaccharides that, that we discovered. I thought, oh my God, that's amazing. We've made this amazing discovery. And then I got the group to check. So this is a table from a, from, a, from a review that was published in 2023. So I always like to check things. So let's go back to Richardson, 19, uh, 1968. If you know anything about lichens, there was a guy called David White, who was really the main guy who worked in lichens in the 60s. So we actually went back to their original reference to check. And in fact, even in the original references, glucose and glucans. And glucans is basically the old name for polysaccharide. So we hadn't made a discovery, and uh, we'd basically made a, a, a rediscovery. Um, so somebody said to me, will there be poetry in this presentation? And there wasn't going to be, um, but I thought I should. And then I remembered John's a bit of a Garstang fan, and so Again, this is genuine. This has always been a really um, poignant. This is the this is the opening verse from Garstang's An Oceanographer's Dream, which which I've got a copy of in my office, and it, and th I mean it really just speak to me. So I built my soul a stately treasure house beside the rolling ocean swell, with cunning apparatus to disclose the gems below that dwell. And I think for me that just sums up the time that I've had um, here in Plymouth. Um, I just want to um, say something really important before before I finish, and we can all get our glass of prosecco. Um, I'm mindful of like the challenges it is to be an academic, both in the university and being a scientist in a research institute. I'm in both locations, but I genuinely think it's one of like the best jobs actually in the world, and I really do. Um, I love every day of it, and part of the fundamental reason why I love every day of it is because I get to work with brilliant people who get to make all this stuff happen. And so many of them are here, but I just want to mention a few people specifically. Um, Joe Taylor up in the top. Joe, if you're listening online, I'm sorry, I could not find a better picture of you. <laughs> but this is Joe Taylor up in the top corner. He's now at CH Wallingford. He is the guy that made all that stabilized top probing happen. And he is the guy that really meant that we could have the discovery of the fungi that's made everything else change. Kim, who's here, sat in the audience. Kim has been with me now for quite some time. Um, Kim has just been making everything happen for the last 10 plus years, maybe, nearly. Um, who else is important here? Uh, I mentioned Nathan. Nathan did the, a lot of the lichen work and a lot of the sequence analysis that I've talked about. Beth, again, with the lichens. And of course, Cordelia has been pick picking particles with me, following on from Berta. And I really just want to really thank all these people for making it all possible. Uh, and so I shall stop there and ask some questions. I won't ask questions. I'll answer some questions. <laughs> yeah. So Michael is happy to take questions. We've also got some questions that were online, but we'll we'll try live ones first. Anyone want to go? There's one. Michael, please talk. Hi, Bill. Um, Colin. Good. Thanks. Well, thanks for a uh, brilliant talk, Michael. Um, I was interested in the, the, the fungus you described infecting the copepods. Um, is there any evidence for that affecting the, the, the populations of copepods at all? Zero. So um, it, it's, it, it's, it, yeah, it's something I've got, got, we've got to look at. So they were, they were discovered off the coast of California in the late 60s. And they would find gravid copepods. I mean, Mechlicob basically fills the copepod. Um, and other than that, and our recent observation of the, the Mechlicobia peaks during the... So I, I could have overlaid the abundance of copepods and they would match perfectly. We don't know anything. However, there's um, other freshwater species within the genus that infect Daphnia. So it does very similar thing to Daphnia, what Zobelli does to copepods. 
And with Daphnia, there's lots of studies shown that they can wipe them out. So there's lots of really cool um, sort of parasite host dynamic stuff doing the freshwater system. So I, we, Kim and I try to ram Mechnicovia down a copepod's mouth. That's how I'm being silly, but we tried to get copepods to eat Mechnicovia. They wouldn't do it. What's quite interesting with Mechnicovia, it actually makes a modified spore that has a harpoon on it. And I think you have to get them to make the harpoon spores. I could yeah, talk about Mechnicovia in a long time. So, but the point is, do you know something, Colin? Copepods, even though they are fundamentally important to marine ecosystems, they're the, the link between the micro and the macro. We know very little about disease, parasites, any, anything like that. There's a nice question here for you. How many named species of marine fungi are there? Um, I don't know. I, I think <laughs> there's not, there's a few hundred. Name, by, and by, what we, I, I'm not going to get into systematics. Named as in it has been described and fit within the, with the Linnaean system. Be yeah. like a, a few, a few hundred. That's it. Taxonomic units, you know, number one five seven B. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's well, it, it's amplicon sequence variants now, but yeah, amplicon sequence variants. We've got loads of them. Fungal um, fungal taxonomy relative to metabarcoding is sort of garbage, really. And I with the whole precision accuracy thing hasn't been sorted out yet. And so, I, yeah, I, I, there is an answer, but okay. there's lots of them, and they're really important. <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> that's the best paradox i've heard in a while <laughs> questions jason are you just waving or is that okay drowning oh yeah fantastic cork Thank, thanks very much um we there's a seaweed course going on this week yeah and we're wondering how important fungi are to the seaweeds very, if, if you know. Oh, yeah, so there's loads of really good stuff. So um, there's some seaweeds that um, some mycologists in the 70s refer to as the inverse lichen. So Pelvisia, Ascophyllum, there's evidence that Ascophyllum has a, a fungus that lives inside it. And if it doesn't have the fungus inside, it just doesn't grow properly. So there's some that have this inverse lichen symbiosis. Um, but also we think there's... Um, Fungi might have an important role to keep some of them alive, but fungi might have a role in processing seaweed. So, in fact, this is part of Beth's PhD. Yeah. When seaweed dies, it gets processed. There's a big hoo-ha, not hoo-ha, a big um, uh, flush of interest now in seaweeds as a source of blue carbon. Is it important, isn't it? But we really think that fungi have an important role in processing seaweed, which is principally polysaccharide, into things that are much more interesting to the ecosystem, like pro proteins. And in fact, a certain somebody, a long time ago, looked in the gut contents of amphipods that feed on seaweeds, and the guts were actually full of fungi, not, not anything else. So the fungi are really important for transitioning that carbon from polysaccharide to, to other things. Okay. So here's a question for you. What does the future of marine mycology look like? <laughs> Who wrote that? Um, um, can I be honest? I think I think it's um, I don't I don't know if it looks good or not because it's it's quite challenging. the 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 paper the the paper that we showed carbon transfer from tet diatoms into fungi we had such a hell of a time getting that published. Reviewers just didn't believe it, and um. I think marine fungi have got a bit of an identity crisis that we need to address first. First, the fact that I can regularly go to meetings and marine, micro, marine microbiologists don't even know that marine fungi exist. So I think the first thing that we've got to do to make, to make it good is just to get them on the map. Mm -hmm. But part of the problem, I think, for marine micro in general, it's a really big, complex topic. And it's just all we're doing all the time is adding complexity. And I think complex topics like this just don't seem to fare well so i don't i i don't know what the answer is okay. lily yep it's coming thanks michael great talk and, and i can sympathize with your last uh, comment there certainly with 30 odd years ago when we were trying to get viruses um, and getting people to understand that viruses play a really important role. Um, I, my question is around the, the terrestrial 
fungi that you're you're seeing out at L4. Do you have any sense of just how active, if at all, they are? You know, are they functional when they're in the marine environment? And you showed some nice data around the salt tolerance uh, yeah. of them, and they also appear to have that tolerance. But so I mean, yeah, so Cordelia's work on the single particles. Um, all of Cordelia's stuff is with RNA. So we can definitely say we're getting an RNA signature of these fungi even out at L4 station. So they're at least producing RNA. So we can make an assumption if they're making RNA, then they're probably still active. But what the significance is, we, we really don't know. Yeah. Um, I'm a bit curious about like the differences between marine fungi and uh, terrestrial fungi. Mm -hmm. And sort of the diff basically the differences between um, the role marine fungi play, because obviously terrestrial fungi are mostly de de decomposers. Yeah, so probably similar. Um, so probably marine fungi have a role as saprotrophs. So the example that we showed with the with the TEP processing fungi, that's a saprotrophic role. So that's similar to um, fungi degrading leaf litter. Let let's say. Um, there's another role that we really don't know. So there's this parasitic role. So I mean, Colin mentioned maybe if Mechnicobia is infecting copepods and it's have a, a really big impact, they could be parasites. So I'd say saprotrophs degrading um, biogenic material like TEP and parasites, but we don't we don't have any sense of the of the relative importance of that or the importance of that versus other groups because the other major saprotrophs in marine ecosystems are bacteria, and we don't know you know fungi just a bit part or are they major players we, we really don't know it's for somebody to to work on somebody the microphone's got to get to the far end there that's okay sorry just following on for that sorry if it's a student question if they're, they're having a, a saprophytic function are they producing a mycelium of sorts that was my question <laughs> yeah so we've seen no no we've in we've seen no evidence of that yet so um planktonic marine fungi are um they're, they're visually quite poorly understood we don't really know what they look like we've done a little bit of work looking down a microscope and they're just a really basic basic hyphal i won't even say a network but no um mycelial networks a la what you see in a terrestrial you know connecting trees together no evidence of that whatsoever yeah yeah micro mycelial networks maybe yeah and Thank you. Hang on, it's just coming. Promise. Thank you. Um, has there been any work on the role of uh, or, or the existence of uh, marine fungi in sediments? Yeah, I could reference to my papers. I, I didn't talk about sediments. Some sediments are loaded with marine fungi. Um, and it seems to be they you get lots of marine fungi in organic rich sediments, but also in polluted sediments. So a really brilliant example of that was the the Gulf um, the Gulf of Mexico oil spill. So Gulf of Mexico oil spill before the oil spill, fungi were were detectable, but maybe a lower component within within the sediment. Post oil spill, they really dominate the sediment. So fungi probably maybe have a role in remediating contaminated sediments. And there's also been some work done on deep sea sediments where there's a gradient of organic matter content versus fungal abundance. So where you get more, more organic matter, you get more fungi. And so it's a bit of a chicken and egg. Are there more fungi because there's more organic matter or are they turning it over? And so, um, yeah, we've done some work on the sediments around the Tamar. And what's quite interesting, you see different communities of fungi in the surface sediment where oxygen is available and then different communities of fungi where there's no oxygen. So there's um, just... Fungi can be aerobes and they can also be anaerobes as well. So we, we see those differences. Mm -hmm. There's a question here, which is, how will climate change influence marine fungi communities? I don't know. It's the same so answer for everything. It's got to be know. there. We don't know. We need to do more work. A few things. Um, we don't know. Um, we need more studies. I mean, you think our our time series is the longest time series ever for fungi. So we just don't, we don't have those types of data. However, a few a few thoughts. One is what's happening to us in in you know Western Europe. We're experiencing it now. We're just getting wetter, aren't we? And we're getting more terrestrial, you know, sort of um, 
transition. So I, I just feel like it's been raining in, perpetually in Plymouth for how long? You think about all that water w rushing down the Tamar, there's more material coming out, so that, that, that could be happening. There is some evidence that fungi don't mind pH change. So in an, in, if ocean acidification is going to manifest as people predict, maybe fungi might start doing better with ocean acidification. And then the other big one, which we I'd like to do more on, is this modification of the ocean that we're doing. It's shame Richard's not here, which is basically putting plastics in the ocean. And it seems like marine fungi really like growing on, on marine plastic, and some of them have a capability to process it as well. So um, it could be, in a, in a, in a future messed-up ocean, fungi actually are happier <laughs> no. um, Malcolm just coming to you thank you for the presentation not surprisingly um, being a paleontologist I have to think in four dimensions whenever I think of anything when we were working in the South Atlantic we got some very strange chemical results from source rocks in the Brazilian oil fields. And there was a huge argument among the Brazilians about whether this was uh, fungi mm. in the source rocks. I'm not an organic geochemist. So I'll stick to what I know a little bit about, and that is offshore transport from the Tamar and the estuaries. We see estuarine foraminifera, for those that don't know foraminifera, they're marine protists, and we see them transported out, which is why we stain the living population so we can see what's been transported in. Now we know what's being transported in, we, we can see by the size dimensions and everything else what's going on. But of course, when I look at what we see round L4 and E1, and the amount of transported material that must be coming out in the benthic foraminifera, I then look at a geological sample and think, what the hell am I going to do to recognize the transported in stuff because I can't stain the living mm. population? So there's wholesale transport, offshore, onshore, mainly offshore. Uh, and really what you were finding is what we see in Corsan Bay and Round L4 and everything like that. And that's what I find particularly interesting. But a lot of my colleagues haven't quite grasped that yet. Yeah, but I mean, to be honest, I think what we're doing is just stitching ourselves up, really, because the idea that we're professing that this is a system to study marine, well, it, it might not be. And this whole you know, land-sea interaction really needs to be sorted out. I think particularly, just thinking about our our location, Plymouth Sound, L4 Station, those time series sites, we, re we really need to get to grips on that. I think, you know, PML have been doing this with the modeling, but how, well, how it impacts the biology, um, yeah, we, we, need, we do need to know more. This, this cleanness that we have where it, it's marine is probably not very true. I think we'll draw it to a close there. Um, we don't have to be scared. We're mycologists, I think Disney said. So it makes us brave. So we can face the future of mycology being brave. That was amazing. Thank you so much. You. Uh, can we just another round of applause, please?